you wanna free your mind with a new episode that gives you an overdose of Brain Snack! Brain Snack, yeah, yeah. We're headed down the self-development highway Looking for the brain Got you a show that feels good to inhale And we're gonna be munching on some brain snacks I got you a podcast where the intros are funny So buckle up for a new show every Sunday Brain snacks are what you all need to Make life so much better Brain snacks, baby Brain snacks, baby Brain snacks Are you annoyed by affirmations? When you hear someone tell you to think positively, do you wait with bated breath for their next conveyance of timeless advice? If affirmations feel like lies and positive thinking feels like denial, then start the journey of incredible learning and growth so that you can create the life you've always wanted now. This is Paul Coliani, host of The Overwhelmed Brain, the personal growth show for the critical thinker. On this show, I discuss practical, down-to-earth steps to help you improve your mood and your sanity and your life. We'll talk about why we do the things we do and what we can do to reach higher levels of happiness and lower levels of stress and overwhelm. My goal is to help you become empowered so that you can create the life you want. If you're looking for that path to happiness but don't quite know where to start, get the ebook Clear the Path to Happiness. Visit theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash books and start the journey you know you want to take. All you need to do is remove some of the obstacles to becoming as happy as you deserve. Get the ebook Clear the Path to Happiness at theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash books. Well, a couple weeks ago, I came across an article in Psychology Today called 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do. I thought, wow, what an odd phrasing of a very important topic. After I finished reading it, I realized that the author of the article hit the nail on the head with every one of those 13 things. So for today, I was going to read you all of the 13 things and discuss each one, but I decided to do one better and instead I reached out to the author and interviewed her. Her name is Amy Morin, and she is a licensed clinical social worker who just happened to have a few experiences in her life that led her to create this list. Not only did she write it as an article to begin with, but she also created a book out of it as well. The book is also called 13 Things Mentally Strong People Don't Do, and I'll have a link to it at my website if you want to find it. Otherwise, let's start this interview because... These are all foundational steps that you can take for yourself that will help you become mentally stronger in every area of your life. And then once we're done, I'll come back and we'll close the show. Enjoy.
Good to hear from you. Wow, thanks for calling in. Absolutely. So you wrote 13 things mentally strong people don't do. Take back your power, embrace change, face your fears, and train your brain for happiness and success. Do you remember that entire subtitle? <laughs> yeah, that one's a little tricky. <laughs> <laughs> but I, was, I put a subtitle for my book, and I, I still can't recall it. But um, yeah, that one's, I was like, wow, that's a lot of words on that cover. But Yeah, it takes me a minute when people ask me the subtitle. I'm like, oh, hold on one second. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, tell me a little bit, like, where did you, where did you grow up, if you don't mind me asking? Um, I'm from a little town in Maine called Dexter. Our only claim to fame is that uh, the Olympics, <laughs> some of the Olympic athletes wore Dexter shoes, and Michael Jackson supposedly learned how to moonwalk in Dexter shoes. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> That's about all we've got. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, before we actually get into this, do you have any questions for me, or are you just ready to go and no, talk about it? No, I don't think it? so. Okay. No, I don't think so. One of the reasons I want to have you on the show is because you talk about the very similar things that I talk about, but I haven't met or talked with anyone who breaks it down like you did. Because there's a lot of personal growth type books out there, which I consider yours, I don't know if you do, but I consider yours a personal growth type book, that are more big picture. They're more Think positively, you know, I always make fun of that. Think positively and everything will be great. And then I read your Psychology Today article and one of the first things you said is, oh, I'm going to read it. We often hear advice like, think positive and good things will happen. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, right, she's right up my alley. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, you know, a lot of uh, self-help books and articles and the advice, it is all, that everybody bases things on the positive, and, you know, I did get some um, uh, questions from people, but why on earth would you come up with a list of what not to do? But I tell people it's like physical strength, that if you wanted to become physically stronger, you'd have to go to the gym and work out, but you have to give up bad habits like eating junk food, and mental strength is much the same, you have to have good habits, but you also have to give up the bad habits, and I think... A lot of people will say things like, well, I already do think positively. But at the same time, they feel sorry for themselves when something happens, but because they still think positively 80% of the time, they don't realize how much that other 20% holds them back. So I really wanted a list of the things that could hold us back in life. Well, I love the title of the book because it's kind of opposite of what you expect. Like when you start saying the title, 13 things mentally strong people, oh, where's she going to go with this? Do? Then you say, don't do. And I'm like, whoa, that's, <laughs> that throws me off. So right. that's interesting. So before we get, I would love to go over each one of these and just I'll, I'll read them to you and you can kind of give me a, the take in your own words, if that's okay. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, before we get into it though, what in the world led you to these insights? You know, I've been a therapist um, 2002. I got out of grad school and I started working as a therapist and helping other people with their problems. And so I was certainly interested in psychology and the mind and stress management and all those sorts of things. But it wasn't until my story became personal that I really sort of um, developed these ideas on what mental strength really is and how to apply them to my own life. And when I was 23, my mother had passed away suddenly from a brain aneurysm, oh, wow. and she and I had been very close, and so it was uh, a major traumatic loss for me. And so at the same time that I was working as a therapist and helping other people with their problems by day, by night, I was figuring out, how do I deal with my own grief? Oh, yeah. And that was certainly a process. And then if you fast forward to three years, on the three-year anniversary of when my mother died, my 26-year-old husband died of a heart attack. Oh, my God. And clearly when you're 26, you're not supposed to have a heart attack. You didn't have any history of heart problems or anything. And so then I found myself with these two unexpected and sudden losses in my life. And I still had to go to work every day to figure out how do I help other people with their problems while I'm privately dealing with my own issues. Yeah. And so certainly my interest in mental strength became personal. And if you fast forward a few more years, I'd gotten remarried, life was looking pretty good, and my 
um, father-in-law got diagnosed with cancer. Mm. And pretty quickly it became clear that it was going to be terminal. And unlike when I had lost my mother and my husband, this time I knew what was coming. And it was one of those times where I just thought, no, I can't go through this again. I can't. I don't want to see my husband lose his dad. Yeah. All those sorts of thoughts. And very easily started to think, oh, you know, why these things always happen have to happen to me. And could have fallen into the trap of feeling sorry for myself. So it was then that I sat down and I wrote my list of the 13 things mentally strong people don't do as a reminder of all the things I couldn't do if I wanted to face my situation with as much courage and strength as I knew that I needed to get through that. And so then I thought, you know, I'll publish my list to the web. It's helpful for me. Maybe it will help somebody else. I had no idea that it would go viral. And <laughs> within a couple of days, millions of people had read it. And then Forbes magazine picked it up and 10 million more people read it there. And <laughs> it just seemed to really catch on. I think the idea of what not to do seemed to really resonate with other people as well. Wow. How do you prepare? Jeez. You, so you know your father-in-law's death is coming. How do you how do you even prepare for that? So did writing the list, was that kind of a healing process in itself? It was. It was one of those, okay, I'm going to, I need these things because, you know, I knew between the time I wrote the list and the time he passed away, that it was probably about three weeks. And, and we knew it was coming towards the end. And so it was just a reminder of, you know, it's okay. I can't feel sorry for myself while I, while I face this. And, and all the other things, I just knew I can't do these things if I want to get through it um, to the very best of my ability. Well, that's your first item on your list. And it's probably, now this list, is it in the order that you originally wrote them? I'm curious. It is. That's exactly how it was. And I am. As it, you know, and interestingly, as this all sort of unfolded, the media started contacting me and asking me questions about it. And so it was, um, and then my father-in-law passed away, and it was four days later that I went to be interviewed for Fox News and um, oh. Forbes. And on camera, and these people were asking me, how'd you come up with this list? And I certainly wasn't in any shape to give them the whole story. Right. And it was very raw, because we you know, as we were planning his funeral service, I was also finding myself that all these people were so excited for me that, that I'd written this viral article. So I just, you know, gave some mundane answers about, well, oh, I'm excited, and, you know, I was a therapist, and I just kind of knew these things. <laughs> and just didn't want to tell the whole world my private story quite yet. And so... Um, but as it's unfolded, and then I got the book deal, and um, things have unfolded since then, and I've been able to tell people, okay, this is the rest of the story, and it's certainly been freeing to tell them that, but we did keep it in the original order that I wrote the, wrote the list. That's fascinating. I wrote, um, I told this story on my show before, I think writing is so powerful because it helps you slow down your thought processes. Because when we're talking to ourselves, we're always thinking, oh, you know, I'm so sad or I'm this and that. And it just thoughts just pass and we give no thought to our thought. So I love, I love the idea of writing things down and really expressing what's going on inside your mind because it does help slow down your mental processes. And when it, when you do that, you're able to, uh, go through and experience some release, I think. You're experiencing a release yeah. because you're expressing it, what's happening in your thoughts on paper or computer screen. And I think it, for me, it helps it organize it too. I think if somebody yes. would have said, well, what are the things you shouldn't do? I probably would have said, well, there's a million things I can't do right now. <laughs> but when it came down to writing it down, I could say, oh, okay, I can do these. I can avoid these 13 things. But had I not written them down, I think I would have been overwhelmed with thinking that there was a million things that I had to do or had to avoid. That's uh, smart. So the 13 things, let's, this is, we'll preface it with this. The 13 things mentally strong people don't do is number one, waste time feeling sorry for themselves. And you kind of went into that a little bit, but why is that number one? Or why is, is that a prominent one? Yeah, because I think a lot of people confuse, you know, sadness and self-pity. And it's okay to feel sad and it's okay to feel grief, but self-pity is more than that. It's exaggerating how bad our situation is or convincing ourselves that it's not fair. And when we begin to experience self-pity, it just keeps us focused on the problem rather than looking for a solution. And even when you can't fix the problem necessarily, you can at least change your attitude about it. And so in my situation, I couldn't fix my father-in-law's illness, but I could certainly say, well, how do I make the 
last few days of his life the best that we can. And if I chose to feel sorry for myself, I wouldn't have been able to do that. And then after he passed away, same thing, to figure out how do I um, grieve and privately feel sad, but without trying to convince everybody else or myself that, you know, my life's not fair, it's terrible and horrible and awful, those sorts of things. So really, it slows you down is when you start feeling sorry for yourself, it's kind of like it's delaying. I mean, this isn't the same as grieving. Right. So, right. They're very different. I think self-pity is when we sort of dig in our heels and say, this isn't fair. Oh. You almost become an act of defiance where you say, you know, this isn't fair and the universe hasn't treated me fairly and I'm not going to do anything about it because it's just not fair and I shouldn't have to. Oh, boy. <laughs> so then you wrote this first item down. And you're like, okay, one of the things that mentally strong people don't do is waste time feeling sorry for themselves. After you wrote that down, did you feel any kind of release from feeling sorry for yourself? Yeah, well, it was one of those moments where I just said, okay, it's a choice. And it reminded me that I didn't have to feel sorry for myself. And I I had the power to decide I'm not going to do this. And instead, I needed to do things differently. Wow. That's fascinating, actually. Because you could stay in that place, but just by writing it down and going through the thought process, it helped you realize that you could get beyond it. It's just, I know it still blows me away. (laughs) Remind myself, not going to do this. Good. Good for you. So the number two is give away their power. Go ahead and talk about that. Yeah, what I mean by that is that sometimes we tend to blame other people for the way that we either think or feel or behave. And it can be it's sort of a way to um, excuse our own behavior or to find an excuse of why we feel bad is to say, well, somebody else makes me feel this way or oh. I, I can't help it that I have to do all these things in life. But in reality, there's very few things that we have to do and nobody can make us feel anything unless we give them permission. So we become the cause of our own emotions. Right, and that we have more control over our emotions than we think we do. I think other people obviously influence our feelings, but mm-hmm. it's not their fault that we feel certain ways. So we can't really go around saying, you make me feel angry. We're actually choosing to feel angry by something that they may have triggered within us. Right. And I think, again, it's a choice and whether we choose to dwell on the thing that, that they did that offended us or whether we choose to say, okay, that's, <laughs> that happened and yeah. it's okay to feel angry about it, but to not blame them for our anger. That's good. Okay. Number three, which is the third thing that mentally strong people don't do, shy away from change. Yeah, our comfort zone is a wonderful place to be in some ways because, you know, have a sense of anxiety. And to step outside our comfort zone and to do something different means we have to face change. And in some some situations, in my situation in particular, I had no choice in the matter. The world was going to change with or without me. So to be willing to embrace change and to know that it's okay and so after a while, we can build confidence in our ability to tolerate the discomfort associated with change. Mm. But because sometimes we avoid it so much, it just reinforces to us that we can't handle it or that we're not strong enough to deal with it. But if you expose yourself to it repeatedly, it gets easier over and over again. One of the things that comes to mind is um, what I do when change occurs that I don't want is I... I like transform inside myself and I develop a bring it on attitude. It's kind of like uh, reversing what I'm feeling. So if I don't want it to happen or if this, you know, I get a flat tire or my girlfriend's breaking up with me, I try to convert the energy inside of me and go, you know what? This sucks, but you know, bring it on. What else you got universe? You know, <laughs> and it really helps me. I don't know if that's uh, what you're teaching there, but I've it, when you accept change in your life, which is inevitable, you just accept it as as it's going to happen. You're going to get a flat tire. You're going to lose your job. And unfortunately, people are going to die in your life. And you're going to have to go through that that process. And so I really like that one. Uh, Mentally strong people don't shy away from change. They, I don't know, they face it. They're, They're ready for it. Accept it. Right. And just like you said, sometimes we can't control it, but bring it on. <laughs> yeah. Perfect segue to number four, which is uh, mentally strong people don't waste energy on things they can't control. 
Yeah, I think so often it's easy to get caught up in worrying about what everybody else is doing or worrying about what's going to happen and focusing on all those things that we just have zero control over. And instead, if you funnel that same energy into the things you can control, you can do some pretty incredible things. And so to notice when we're distracted by things we can't control is the first step. And then to figure out how do I... How do I channel my energy into something that's more productive? And it can do incredible things in our lives when we start doing that. That's wasting energy on things they can't control. That's so true. That's hard for people with control issues. <laughs> yes, it is. And you know, and I think a lot of us have a tendency we want to micromanage or we want yeah. to, you know, try to always control the outcome because it somehow reduces our anxiety if we think, okay, but. You know, I always tell people you can throw a good party, but you can't control whether people have fun. Or you can prepare for a storm, but you can't stop the storm from coming. So to figure out what are the things I can focus on that I can control, and to do your best at them. And you'll do a lot better if you're not wasting your energy on those other things that you can't control. Well, I love how these things segue into one another, because we went from shy away from change to not wasting energy on things that you can't control. And that's Change is something you can't control. <laughs> it's got to right. happen. <laughs> right. So number five is mentally strong people don't worry about, oh, that's a good one. Mentally strong people don't worry about pleasing others. And this is one that a lot of people struggle with or a lot of people um, don't like that I have this on my list. Mm-hmm. They say you should please other people. And certainly you should want to please your boss or your spouse and that sort of thing as long as you're behaving according to your values. Mm. I think so often people try to please everyone in their life, and ultimately they lose sight of what their own goals are because they're so worried about making other people happy or they're worried that that they're going to offend somebody to the point that it becomes detrimental. Yeah. One of the things I learned growing up is I I realized that I myself was a people pleaser. Born Mm -hmm. in an alcoholic household, you know, you always want to make sure that you don't invoke the behavior of the alcoholic in the family. So you become more people pleasing. And so right. I, I carried this into my adult uh, world and uh, I figured out that people, the, the way to get over people pleasing is to start honoring your personal boundaries. And like you said, honoring your values. And that really started the process of getting me out of people pleasing mode because I started thinking about myself instead of others first. And I think that's probably what you're, where you're going with that. Yeah, that plenty of people will say, well, isn't that selfish to think about yourself? <laughs> and the answer to that is, well, no, I'm not saying you should be selfish or that you shouldn't help others, but you should help other people because you want to, not because you think that you have to. And so often, true people pleasers sort of become resentful because they think, oh, everybody's taking up all my time or I have to do all this stuff for everybody else because they don't dare say no. Right. And so to figure out that it's okay to say no to people, and they might be mad at you, but that's okay. And to be able to tolerate people not liking you or not being mad at you is it can be quite uncomfortable if you're not used to it. Toleration is huge. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot. Then we have, uh, let's see, number six, which is mentally strong people don't fear taking calculated risks. Now, this is an interesting one. Go, go ahead with this one. You know, I think we're pretty bad at calculating risk. We go by our emotion a lot of the time so that if something feels scary, then we think it must be really risky. But in reality, our emotions are often uh, not in line with the facts. So for example, there's plenty of people who not fly in an airplane because they're terrified of it. But we know statistically your chances of dying in an airplane are much less than than dying in in a car crash on the way to the airport. Yeah. And, and yet people get in a car every day, and those same people, though, will never get in an airplane because the airplane might crash. But there's a lot of examples of stuff like that. When we're really happy, we make we overpromise, and we tell people, oh, I'd love to do that, and, <laughs> and we overestimate our abilities. And then when we're nervous about something, we underestimate our abilities and say, oh, I don't think I could do that. And rather than trying to figure out what's the actual risks involved, we usually just Uh, go with our emotional reaction to that and convince ourselves, well, I was really nervous about that, so I shouldn't have done it, and I'm glad I didn't, or I shouldn't take that risk. Hmm. In reality, when we figure out how do you calculate risk and balancing your emotion with your logic, then you can move forward with much greater confidence, knowing, okay, I'm 
there may be some level of risk involved, but I'm willing to take those risks when I understand them. So what you're saying is, is kind of like, all right, if you're in fear mode, if you have this fearful emotion, step into like, and, and you correct me if I'm wrong, step into analyzation mode and let's just analyze this from a factual standpoint. Yeah. And so I think the better off we become at figuring out how do you, you know, balance your emotions with the, with the facts, the easier it is to calculate the risk and move forward. But it's a process in learning. How do you, how do you do that? Because like you said, for people with social anxiety, walking into a room with strangers mm. feels really scary. You know, most people have an incredible fear of public speaking. Well, nobody's died public speaking, but <laughs> yeah, most people fear public speaking more than they do death. <laughs> so I think it just goes to show our emotions are not always rational. Have you have you had to um, get over some fears of public speaking now that this book is out? <laughs> yeah, you know, I I grew up, I tell this story a little bit in my book, I grew up and I was terrified. I was the shyest kid in my class, you know, growing up in a small town in Maine, but I still, I didn't speak even in the 20 kids in my classroom. My teacher would ask me to read my papers, and I wouldn't do it. I was frozen with, with fear. And um, mm. I, I was the valedictorian of my class, so I had to give a speech at graduation in front of the entire school and their parents, you know, the whole nine yards. And I was like, I can't do that. That's not an option. And, but the school really didn't give me a choice. They said, you know, no, you have to do this. <laughs> and... Um, and so I, I orchestrated this plan with my friends that, because I was really afraid nobody would clap. I'd get up, I'd say something, I'd embarrass myself and be completely rejected by the audience. So mm. I created a plan with my friends so that when I was done speaking, they all agreed they were going to stand up and cheer like they'd been to the best rock concert that they'd ever seen. That's great. And so knowing that in the back of my head, that no matter how bad I did, I at least had a handful of friends that were going to cheer for me, I was able to get through it. That's fascinating. <laughs> it's really an excellent me. idea. And it really taught me that, okay, you know, it's just, it's not nearly as bad as I imagined it to be. It wasn't awful. It wasn't horrible. And thankfully, my wonderful friends did that for me. And then I think everybody else feel, felt peer pressured into standing up as well. <laughs> and, and you know, but, and then over the years when I've had, you know, other things in life that have happened to me, it's been a wonderful reminder that, you know, those things don't matter. If you get up on a stage and you embarrass yourself, it's not the end of the world, but it's okay. And really learning how to, not to sweat the small stuff, I guess, but to know that public speaking is not nearly as scary as we tend to make it into our minds. <laughs> I bet you're an introvert. Um, yeah, I am a <laughs> introvert by nature. And so um, people here. will say now, because now I can get on a stage and talk in front of groups of people and I'm, it's fine, I enjoy it. And um, But, you know, down in my core, I really like to be to be by myself, or I'd rather be sometimes in the audience as well, but to be able to get over those fears, because as introverts, we often think, oh no, this is going to be awful, and we can <sighs> convince ourselves it's way worse than what it actually is. <laughs> That's true. I mean, I've been an introvert all my life, but I also enjoy mingling and talking and speaking, and so I think we probably both have a mix of both. Right. Uh, but what I noticed is that when I need a break, I do typically like to be alone or with someone that's close to me. Right. Yeah. Probably you are. Okay. Same as you. Uh, number seven, mentally strong people don't do is dwell on the past. Yeah. I think there's two main reasons that keep us stuck in the past. For some of us, it's when something bad happens, it, it's hard to move forward and focus on the present. For other people, when they've had a, a, um, if they were to look at their past and it was a great time, sometimes people think, well, those are the glory days and <laughs> life is never going to be that good again, whether they look back at high school or college or maybe when their kids were home and they think they sort of romanticize the past and think, well, life could never be that good again. And, right. and it makes it really hard for them to focus on the present and plan for the future. So to figure out what do you need to do to make peace with the past? And I think for all of us, it's a little bit different. But how is it that you're going to leave the past behind? It's okay to reflect on it, but you don't want to ruminate on it or to keep it from from helping you to be who you need to be today. So the need to figure out, well, how did it affect me, but also how is it not going to hold me back into reaching my full potential now? How Okay, so you don't want to... Yeah, I get this because there are times in my life where I would think back to the past and I get that nostalgic feeling. That's a That's a a good thing on dwelling on the past, right? Nostalgia. And what I've learned about myself is 
nostalgia is not being, and this is my own personal definition, nostalgia is not being happy enough with the way things are now. And so, yeah. so I, I tend to remember what they used to, or at least I used to do this, what they used to feel like at the time. Like uh, before I got into any type of career, maybe I was 14 years old and I was lying on the floor watching a cartoon or whatever at home. And it was such a good feeling. I was like, oh, those are the good old days. But in reality, you know, my life is completely different now. I'll never get that moment back. And it just has to be something that is a a good memory to have, but not something I keep going back going, how do I get that? How do I get that back? How do I get that back? Is that kind of where you're going with that? Right, that you can appreciate the past, but to know that um, you can still enjoy the moments today, that you can have plenty of good moments in your life from here on out and that you don't necessarily have to recapture what you had back then. Hmm. Okay. Number eight is make, okay. So mentally strong people don't make the same mistakes over and over. Yeah. I think for a lot of us as kids, we were taught that mistakes are bad or that they're shameful or Hmm. we shouldn't make them. And so then rather than learn from them, we focus our energy on covering them up or, trying to pretend that they didn't happen. Or sometimes we're stubborn enough to think, well, it's not my fault that it didn't work out. And so to really move forward, we need to learn from those mistakes to avoid repeating them over and over and over again. But that's hard to do. I think a lot, pride often gets in the way and we think, well, just because it didn't work out the first time, it will the second time, whether we're talking about quitting smoking or losing weight or going for the next job interview. And we blame external circumstances or other people, but hmm. if we made a mistake, we need to own it and figure out how can I learn from it. But I know I'm right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep doing the same thing over and over. This reminds me of something that I do uh, still today. Is like I like to um, correct my posture whenever I'm kind of bent over, and uh, or you know standing up, bending over, or just you know things that you're supposed to do: stand up straight, sit up straight, so you have a good back when you're older. And so I catch myself going, oh, I got to correct my posture. And I'll go, oh, I'll do it later. Or I'll make yeah. up for it later. And I found myself saying that more often than not going, wait, I never catch up. If I don't do it now, <laughs> I'll never do right. it. Right. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that's yep. an interesting one. Uh, number nine, mentally strong people don't resent other people's success. Yeah, when life is going well, I think it's easy to be happy for other people. But when you have problems in life, it's harder to look at your your neighbor who makes more money or your sibling who is more attractive or has more wealth than you do. And so to figure out, both in the good and the rough times in life, how do you celebrate with other people and instead of resenting them because their life seems easier or because they seem to have more and... I think sometimes the solution to that is to look at cooperating with other people rather than competing with them and say, how can I get you on my team and how can I be happy for you when you do well and hopefully you'll be happy for me when I do well but that we won't compete against each other or always have to one-up one another. Mm. My girlfriend calls that (laughs) co-opetition. (laughs) Yes. It took me a second to wrap my brain around the word, but yeah. (laughs) It's a good one. I like that. Yeah. Well, it also reminds me of how we compare ourselves to others. It's like, oh, right. I only make whatever, 50 grand a year, 20 grand a year, and he makes uh, $500,000 a year. It's like, why are you comparing yourself? It's like apples and oranges. Why don't you compare right. yourself to someone that's kind of in your same league and then see if that motivates you to take another step forward to improve your life or improve your results somehow. Right, and I think so often, you know, we get these little snippets of other people's lives, and we think, well, clearly they have a better life than I do. Well, you don't never know what goes on behind closed doors. Right. We don't know all the other problems those people have, but yet we we compare ourselves to them, and we think, well, we should, you know, I should be doing better because he's doing better, but really, you don't really know what, what the other person has going on in their life, and so if we can just focus on our own path to success in life and don't worry about whether somebody else is reaching their goals or not, just focus on your own goals. Good. All right. We're almost there. Number 10, mentally strong people don't give up after a failure. So many successful people have these incredible stories of failure. And 
but I think we wish that people were instant successes or overnight fame and those sorts of things, but it doesn't happen that people don't just suddenly get successful with their first business venture most of the time. It usually takes failing several times, and it sort of goes back to learning from your mistakes, that to be able to learn from your failure and bounce back from it and to be willing to try again after you fail. It takes courage, but often that's the best way to succeed ultimately. Yeah, giving up after a failure, it's kind of like, oh, I can't change my flat tire. I'm just going to sit here and um, I'll just I'll live here at the side of the road for a while. You ha- I mean, there are some failures that, you know what, you got to push through it. You just got to make it happen. Or like you said, don't give up. Do you believe there's always a way to like get beyond a failure? I mean, what is failure? Is it like kind of an emotional uh, setback when you fail? Is that what really holds people back? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, there's probably uh, limits to us. You know, I probably, if my goal in life was to be a NFL player, probably wasn't going to happen. <laughs> and at some point, to, to be able to accept that that may not be my skill and talent area in life, but but to move on and find out what it, what else could I pursue that, that would still be worthwhile to me in life, and rather than just giving up and saying, you know, I can't do all the things I wanted to do in life, and um, consider myself a failure, but instead to say, okay, if that's not the the hand I was dealt, what else can I do with the hand I do have? Mm, good way to say it. Number 11, mentally strong people don't do, uh, for all you extroverts out there, fear mm-hmm. alone time. You know, I think even for a lot of us introverts, the <laughs> technology these days makes it so that oh, you never really have to be alone. You can have your smartphone on and your radio playing in the background and the TV on and it can always be connected with other people over social media and for a lot of people it's really difficult to be alone with their thoughts even if it's just for a few minutes that they're always um, multitasking and doing as many things as they can just because they don't want to be alone with their thoughts or people that have trouble sleeping at night so they try to sleep with the radio or the TV on because it's too difficult they say that my mind just won't shut off Mm. And I think that's often because we don't ever give our mind a chance to work through things or to process what goes on in the day or think about our progress and our goals. So I always encourage people to be willing to be alone. And I think we often confuse being busy with being important. Mm. You think there's yeah. more things you have in your social calendar than it must be the more important that you are, but it's okay to sit home on a Friday night by yourself. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I totally agree. I think one of the things that um, I told my sister who was getting into meditation, and she goes, I'm learning about meditation. I was like, one of the ways I like to meditate is she said, something comes to mind and I can't get it out of my mind. It bothers me. I said, well, one of the things you can do is let it come to mind. First of all, don't resist it and just allow whatever to unfold, to unfold, whatever emotions you have about it, whatever happens, and then explore what's coming to mind too. Don't try to resist it. I think a lot of people try to resist what comes to their mind and which sets it back to appear another day, like repressing it, but letting it come to mind and just thinking about it or visualizing or hearing or whatever's going on in your head until it's done, until you're bored with it. Because eventually thoughts will dissipate. You will have thought of every possible angle of what you're thinking about until there's really nothing else more to think about. And I think that kind of releases the emotional energy behind it sometimes too. That's just my own personal take on it. Yeah, I think you're right. Often we tell ourselves, don't think about that. Well, the more you tell yourself, don't think about something, the more that you think about it. (laughs) Exactly. So sometimes you need to say, uh, I sometimes tell people, well, set aside 20 minutes a day to worry about that thing or to (laughs) think about that thing. And then when you think about it outside that 20 minutes, just remind yourself, I'm going to think about that later. And then during that 20 minutes time that you set aside, indulge yourself completely. Think about it. And then when you're done, move on and say, maybe you need to think about it every day for 20 minutes, but to let yourself process that. Absolutely. That's good. Schedule time for your worries and concerns at 6.35 p.m. every day. (laughs) Sit down for 20 minutes and then worry about it then. The rest of the time, have a great life. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and plenty of people, they'll find that to be helpful because sometimes we worry about worrying. And yeah. then it just becomes this big ball of craziness where you think, well, all right, now I'm worried about, am I going to worry about that? Or I don't want to go do this or do that because I might be anxious. And suddenly you think, well, what's going on here? <laughs> well, I like that because you're allowing 
the worry. And because uh, when right. we resist it, when we resist it, it continues to build energy and then you get more emotional about it. And then you're like you said, you're worrying about worrying. So allowing right. that scheduling it or whatever you have to do just to allow it to exist. Great idea. All right. Number 12 is mentally strong. People don't feel the, Oh, I love this one. Don't feel the world owes them anything. <laughs> yeah. I think so often we, we wish that things were, um, fair, but by fair, we mean equal. So we think we should be dealt a, a fair hand in life. So mm. if somebody else gets something, we should need to make sure we get our piece of the pie. And I think it's easy to sometimes look around and decide, you know, who's deserving of something. Well, you didn't deserve that, or mm. I deserved it, or I had this bad thing that happened to me in my soul, therefore I deserve something good to happen. But life doesn't work that way. And just because you maybe did something good doesn't mean you deserve something great to happen to you, or just because you're a nice person doesn't mean <laughs> good things are going to come your way, or just because you have a college degree doesn't mean the world owes you a job. <laughs> and figure out, okay, if you don't expect the world to owe you things, then you can worry about yourself and the things that goes back to the things that you can control in life rather than feeling digging in your heels and saying, I deserve better than what I've got. That's going to be offensive to a lot of people when you say that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay with that. <laughs> <laughs> you, know? you know, I think, uh, you know, again, to figure out, well, maybe some people in life need more than others, and that's okay, but we're not the um, moral police or anybody who gets to figure out, okay, who deserves what piece of the pie. It just doesn't work like that, and we're, I don't think we'd be very good judges of that anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I think of um, people who are into insurance fraud, and it's like you get people like that who are forcing the world to owe them something. <laughs> right. And they're on the opposite spectrum. And then there's people like my dad, who's passed on many years ago, who felt that the world did owe him. And I'm not sure why, because mm -hmm. I wasn't, I didn't see too much of um, him giving back to the world you know, in a philanthropic sort of way. But he still felt like when things didn't happen, that the the whole world, I think it's that victim mentality yeah. that people pick up. So he had that victim mentality. Like victim mentality is when you feel like uh, the world's against you, I guess. Right. And that you've been wronged more than anybody else. So mm. therefore, you know, your life is worse or something like that. But yeah, I think plenty of people have that, in their heads that, you know, their life for some reason is, is deserves better than what they've gotten. And rather than work to fix it, they just focus on, I deserve better. So mentally strong people don't feel the world owes them anything. They like it. Okay. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. And number 13 is mentally strong people don't expect immediate results. We can get so much these days, you know, from the touch of a button, <laughs> whether it be that we're ordering something online or you're doing something with your phone. And, but real change in life doesn't work that fast. It takes a long time for personal growth or whether we're talking about losing weight or getting rid of a bad habit or picking up newer and healthier habits that we don't just change overnight at the touch of a button, but it takes time. And I think so often it's tempting to give up after three days of trying something new. If we don't like it, we say, well, that didn't work. <laughs> and we don't keep at it, but to know that Real change, it's not going to be immediate, and that you need to stick to it, and the going will get tough, but to look at it as a, a marathon rather than a sprint, and to know that you're going to have setbacks sometimes, but that just because you had a setback doesn't mean it didn't work. You can keep working to overcome those so that in the big picture, you can reach your goals and get to be where you want. Well, I like that one too, because I talk to online entrepreneurs all the time, and what happens is they compare themselves to other people that are getting results faster. And so what happens is that they think that they're failing uh, because they're not getting the results that the other person's getting, even though they've, they've only been online for a month or, or six months or trying to make money online with any type of online business for even a year. When you think back before the internet, how long did it take a business typically to profit in the brick and mortar world, like three years typically. So then people get online and we're, like you said, we're so used to immediate access, immediate results. When I want to find information, I can find it in a snap. So 
why can't I build a website and put ads on it and make money as soon as possible within a month? And if you compare yourself to a brick and mortar business that took three years to finally generate profit, you've got a long way to go. Right. <laughs> but if you think about advertising back in the day when you had to advertise say, through the regular mail, but now you can reach people in, in a matter of seconds. Yeah. And I think you're right. We want to check our analytics to see exactly how many how many results we're getting right this very minute. Not not going to wait weeks to find that out even. Exactly. Even with the overwhelmed brain, I noticed after a few months, I was like, why aren't I making any, any money with this? <laughs> I'm doing stuff that other people are doing, but I'm not making any money. And so I started feeling right. like a failure. I started feeling like, what's going on? I was like, wait a minute. I've only been doing this three months. <laughs> <laughs> it might take a year or two to build any type of foundation, you know, because people have to get to know you and they don't, they don't know who I am. I'm just appearing on the scene. I just, it just took a while to, um, for me to get through some mo my own personal growth and realize that, you know, some people are flukes. Some people can get, start a business or do anything they want and get immediate success. So this is kind of in line with your number 13, expecting immediate results. I think we expect immediate results because we see someone else, very few people who did it and say, Hey, we can do that too. And I had another interview today that said, you got to put in the work. You just, you, yeah. you got to keep putting in the work, whether it's in personal growth, career and success, all this stuff takes time and it takes work. And sometimes it'll happen faster and sometimes it'll happen slower. And, and some people are flukes and some people never get it off the ground because of so many variables. I think that's a good way to um, end the list, expecting immediate results. Have you come up with any more of these since the book? <laughs> uh, you know, those are the, the 13 that have really stuck with me, those thoughts, behaviors, and feelings. I don't think I've come up with, I'm sure I could, you know, go on and on and on, but I haven't come up with any major ones that I really thought, oh, I should have added that to the list. <laughs> uh, well, then this will probably last a while. When did it actually, did you write this first? November of 2013. So it's been like a year and a half, almost. Yeah, and it, you know, it unfolded fairly quickly. It, um, I published it to the web in November of 13, and then um, by January, I had plans to, to write the book, and HarperCollins was on board, and I got the book written, and the rest is history, I guess. It just hit the shelves um, a few weeks ago. Oh, has your life changed because of it? Uh, in some ways, yes. I certainly... Um, you know, have more speaking engagements and more opportunities, and I can't tell you how neat it is to walk through the Target and see my book on the shelf. <laughs> um, but you know, underneath it all, I'm still still the same me who you know I sort of call myself an accidental author. I didn't set out to write a book, yeah. but it certainly it wasn't immediate results either. I've written for websites for years and years and years, and certainly have never had an article that reached that many millions of people within days. So. It wasn't an overnight success or anything like that when it came to getting a book deal by any imagination, but it wasn't anything I'd planned to do either. Well, those are the best types of successes when someone just going out there sharing information with the world or sharing how they grew and, and healed through some of the stuff you went through. Like, I, I can't imagine what it's like. I haven't, this is one thing that I'm going to face someday is uh, the loss of someone very close. Now, I don't know who's going to be first. It could be me. I don't know. <laughs> but it's, am I prepared for this? You know, it, it, when this happens, am I prepared? So I think I'll keep your list handy. I'll keep your book handy. Well, good. Because I always tell everybody, you know, I'm not, um, I don't declare that I'm mentally strong or that I don't need this list. I come by it honestly. And I think we can all choose. It's like we could all choose to become physically stronger. You can choose to become mentally stronger. It's just a matter of making it a priority in your life and choosing to do the things that will improve your life and then to give up the bad habits that could hold you back. Well, this is great. Uh, I appreciated your time today and I'm grateful that you took the time between all your other interviews. You know, I'm between Fox news and Forbes, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Some unknown, uh, personal growth show in the, well, I don't know. We reach a lot of countries, so, but, um, Oh, I'm honored to, to have been a guest on the show. Well, thank you so much. Now, how can people find this book? How can they uh, either get in touch with you or just uh, find the book? Where My website is the best place, which is amymorinlcsw.com. And that's Amy, M-O-R-I-N, 
And then the, yep. the words LCSW, which is yep. Licensed Clinical I Social Worker. Licensed Clinical Social Worker, yep. And um, on my website is all the places you can buy the book, and there's a video that sort of explains the story behind the book and um, a bunch of other stuff on there as well. Well, great. We'll just send people your way because this is the stuff I love to talk about. This is the this is practical advice, and you, of course, get into more detail in your book about everything we talked about. So. Yes, and I try to offer. You know, I tell people when my list tells you what not to do, but then my book tells you what to do instead and how to do those mental exercises to to get stronger. Okay, great. So it tells you what not to do, and this is what you need to do. Right. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Well, Amy, it was a pleasure. Well, thank, thank you, you. Very much, Thank you so much. For, it was good talking with you. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. There's an offshoot topic I want to quickly touch on regarding this interview, and it's this. You never know what something is going to amount to. Amy wrote this as a blog article over a year ago. It was a list of things she wrote down to help her get through some tough times. She felt the healing from this list and published it online. Soon it went viral and was read by millions. Then a publisher picked up on it and wanted to turn it into a full-fledged book. Amy didn't set out to create a book. She set out to share something with the world that she believed would be helpful to others. This kind of thing can happen to any one of us who wants to help others. When you move into a space of compassion, you move into a space of helping. It doesn't mean you become an incessant people helper. It just means you're compassionate and want other people to succeed or be happy. Amy did this. She shared an article to help others. She wasn't looking for a reward. She just cared. Just cared care and you will be fulfilled in so many more ways than you can imagine. But if you approach people and situations where your only intention is selfish, you will get quick rewards and at the same time, long-term disappointment and rejection because people will begin to realize who you really are. I mean, it's okay to be selfish when you are also caring and compassionate at the same time. It's okay to enjoy the rewards in life as long as getting them isn't your sole intention. Even if you want to be a multi-millionaire, that's okay too. Just remember that those who care will bring meaning into their lives. And those who don't may only bring the money but no one to share it with. This episode is all about becoming mentally strong. But if I were to add anything to this list... I would add that mentally strong people don't figure out how they can win, but how they can help others win. You will win when you help others win. Like the quote by Zig Ziglar that goes, You can have everything in life that you want if you would just help other people get what they want. With that kind of philosophy, you will almost always win. And sure, there are going to be people that take advantage of your kindness, but That's when your personal boundaries kick in and you can let them know you have more respect for yourself than to allow them to take advantage of you. Kindness, caring, and compassion. It's tough sometimes, I realize. Sometimes you're in a bad mood or sometimes you really don't want to be with the people you're with. Just keep Amy's list and everything else we talked about today in mind so that you don't end up grumpy or down more times than not. You have incredible mental power and will be much happier if you strengthen it one day at a time. I'm going to read the list again and I want you to pick one thing from the list that you can start working on today. Just one. That way, when you are comfortable with that one thing and you're mentally stronger in that one area, you'll have enough momentum to go on to the next one. Here they are. Mentally strong people Don't waste time feeling sorry for themselves. Mentally strong people don't give away their power. They don't shy away from change. They don't waste energy on things they can't control. They don't worry about pleasing others. Now that's geared towards people pleasers who let people cross their boundaries. Mentally strong people don't fear 
taking calculated risks. They don't dwell on the past. They don't make the same mistakes over and over again. How many times have you dated the same type of person? Every time and it turned out badly. And there are many examples of this particular one. Now, mentally strong people don't resent other people's success. I used to be really bad at this until I realized that my resentment of others' success actually prevented me from being a success myself. Uh, They don't give up after a failure. Mentally strong people don't fear alone time. Hey, sometimes you just got to be with your own thoughts, even if you don't like them. They don't feel that the world owes them anything. And finally, mentally strong people don't expect immediate results. And if you've ever used the internet or a microwave, you've probably gotten used to immediate results. Well, that's the show for today. I want you to succeed. So pick one of those 13 things and run with it. What do you need to work on? Any of them? All of them? Whenever a doubt comes up in your life, run through this list and figure out which one might be the case. When you develop mental strength, it doesn't mean bad things won't happen. It just means that when they do, you'll be better prepared for them and will recover faster. Sometimes moving forward helps us get beyond our past. So take action and move forward in any way you can. Build that momentum and start changing your life now. Thank you for listening to another episode of The Overwhelmed Brain. I thank Craig, Lena, David, Billy, and a cycling prince on Twitter. I thank Janet, Lena, Graham, Sandy, Rachel, Naveen, and Anna for subscribing to the newsletter. And how about Jennifer, Nathaniel, Nushin, Pura, Angel, or I'm sorry, Angela, Krista, Don, Irving, Cash, Rhonda, Trisha, Francine, Joanne, Jennifer again, Dan and Jen, (laughs) wow, lots of Jens this week, for their direct messages. And lastly, Leah, Lauren, Tracy, and Greg on Facebook. Keep up with the show by heading over to theoverwhelmedbrain.com and sign up for your weekly personal growth message. You can also write to me anytime by sending me an email to paul at theoverwhelmedbrain.com. If you are using the Amazon link on the website, I want to thank you too. You can support the show simply by shopping at Amazon. Just use the link, theoverwhelmedbrain.com forward slash Amazon. If you find this show valuable to you, just say thank you by using the link when making your next purchase from them. You are making a difference, and it's going towards a good cause. You. If I didn't call your name in this episode, just know that I appreciate you and thank you for being there for me. Listening learning, and growing. We talked about the 13 things that mentally strong people don't do, but you know there are so many more. Think about what's lacking or not so good in your life right now and figure out if one of those things applies or perhaps a new one that we haven't talked about today. What I love about today's subject is that you can practice what mentally strong people do simply by playing the role. Like the time I felt a lack of confidence walking into a job interview. I just pretended to be someone who had confidence and I played that role throughout the interview. Pretending or playing the role can literally change your state. It can empower you. So when you have trouble figuring out which of today's items would help you most, just pretend you are the person that can succeed and notice if your mood and behavior changes. Step into your power and be firm in your decisions and actions so that you can create the life you want. When you do this, you'll discover what I already know to be true about you. That you are amazing. Amazing.